Okay, today is Trinity Sunday. I don't know. Maybe. Go ahead and speak, see if it pauses. Oh. Yes, yes. Today is Trinity Sunday, and we take this time uh, to acknowledge and marvel at the nature of the great triune God. And because today is also our Bible study service format for the month, we want to study the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit united as one, one being, one God. Now this is, as you can understand, a study on the nature of God. And one thing that we probably already understand, but it bears mentioning again, is that we cannot fully understand or comprehend God. We cannot fully understand a being who has existed for all eternity, never created, right? No beginning, no end. And sometimes because we cannot understand God the way we would like to with our finite minds, we tend to reshape him, you know, recast him in a way that is more accessible to us in our finite thinking. And we tend to put him in a box like that. But God's nature is a great mystery that we must respect. So rather than limiting him, let's accept the fact that we cannot understand all there is to, all, to know about God. And like we sang in the song, we stand in awe of God and uh, we wonder of him. Um, it's like the Bible, you know, many times we may have thought the Bible tells us about God. Well, yes, the Bible does, but the Bible only tells us the, the, a little bit about God that he chooses to reveal about himself right now. I mean... Scripture hints that the angels still discovering more about God after the who knows billions of years and God's created them, and there's still more to find. So um, we can't think that we can know all about God there. But one thing we do know for sure is that God loves us. He made us for love and relationship. We'll get into that, and that He cares for us and He has big plans for us. Um, we're doing a Bible study titled The Doctrine of the Trinity. Um, we're going to be basing this on um, one of our theologians, Mike Morrison. Uh, he wrote an article that uh, is, I think the basic title is An Introduction to Trinitarian Theology. So we're going to be taking much of information today from that, you know, um, presenting it in such a way that it can be like in this format, the Bible study. Like I said, uh, He's very sharp and scholarly, but that's not, you know, we're going to use um, how he does it, but it's, got, it's not going to be in a scholarly way, you know. But um, let's go ahead and, and look at that. Um, like I said, we're talking about the Trinity, Trinitarian theology. Now, why do we need this? Why do we need to talk about this at all? Why do we need to understand this Trinitarian theology, you know? I don't think I ever heard the term used until it was recently used by our denomination. I may have come across it, but because we at, the, at one time did not embrace the Trinity, you know, we thought the Holy Spirit, for example, was not a person. So I didn't hear too much about Trinitarian theology, because every time we heard the word Trinity, it was like, you know, no, 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 get, get rid of that, you know, we don't want to turn that. But our understanding has changed, and so now we embrace that understanding. So why do we need to understand, though? Why do we need to have this understanding or even awareness of it? Well, one part is, one reason is because it's central to our understanding of other biblical doctrines. Well, the other doctrines that we have um, can have their basis, can have their foundation in the understanding of the Trinity. Uh, we might say, we, we call it Trinitarian theology, we may call it Incarnational Trinitarian theology because it's about Jesus, the incarnate one who came to earth. We could call it a Trinitarian Christ-centered theology. Perhaps we've heard all those phrases used 
in our more recent years as we began to embrace this concept. What we call our theology Trinitarian because we believe the doctrine of the Trinity is the organizing principle for other doctrines. We're talking about sin, we're talking about salvation, we're talking about the church, other areas, and we will ask the question, and we're talking about each of these, how does the doctrine of the Trinity help us understand that? How does the doctrine of the Trinity help us understand salvation, the church, uh, sin, for example? So, how is it connected with the nature of God and of who God is, right, in His innermost being? That's why we want to study that, because we want to understand it as a basis, as a foundation for understanding these other areas that we do. You know, some, some time ago we did the statement of beliefs. We did the whole series. It took, what, about a year and a half or so to, to cover those in our Bible studies. And uh, we see that as we look at those, we can see that understanding Father, Son, and Spirit is the foundation for helping us to understand those because they're involved. This is all about God. Everything that we do, everything in worship is about God. And so everything circles around God being in the center of it all. We seek a deeper understanding about God's relationship with humanity. We seek an understanding of what God's purpose is in creating us, the way He saves us, and how we should respond to God. We believe that our theology is true to the Bible. Now, we may have uh, disagreements with others on the Trinity. I know we do with our splinter groups. But other groups that don't embrace the Trinity at all, other groups that not even say the Holy Spirit was, is, a, is a, not a person, but that Jesus was created. You know, there are other groups that have all these various, their own understanding of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Or some don't even think it's God in three persons, right? But we believe that our theology is true. And it helps make sense of what we are doing and why, why we're here, why the church. And it helps us in understanding, as I mentioned, those different doctrines that relate to it. So this is the approach that we're taking is what the early church called faith-seeking understanding. You know, we have faith that we know certain things, but we know that we, there's more that we can know that we don't. We already understand and believe some things about God. However, we are also convinced there's so much more to know and understand. And so we continue in our pursuit of this understanding and of this knowledge. You know, you can say we've fallen in love with Jesus. And we'd like to learn more about who he is. You know, the relationship he has with us and what he has in mind for, for us. You know, God didn't just create us and then just leave us off and say, okay, guys, you're on your own. He doesn't do that. He is intimately involved with us from start to finish. And so we want our understanding to be based on the Bible and the way that God has revealed himself to us, the way he's revealed to us, to himself to us, ultimately and personally, in Jesus Christ. That's the first part of the two parts of why we want to know this or why we want to study this Trinitarian theology. Uh, the, another way is that it has practical significance, understanding the Trinitarian, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. It has practical significance, and it's worth focusing on. It's worth something that we take some time to, to look at, especially in, in this format. You see, the doctrine of the Trinity is more than just information about God. You ask any Christian who is, believes in the Trinity, what is the Trinity? And they'll think that the whole sum total of the Trinity is, okay, you've got the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one. They're absolutely correct, right? It's all about God. But then the question is, why should we care? You know, what does that have to do with us? Does it have anything to do with us? Does it make any difference to us in earth? And of course, we know the answer is yes. Absolutely, unequivocally, uh, qualified yes. The doctrine of the Trinity is about relationships. Front and center, when you look at it, it's about relationships. And the relationships that are involved, that the Trinity covers, encompasses, and affects, includes a relationship, first of all, with the divine Godhead, the three persons in one, but then also 
relationships among us, you and I, you know, how we interact with the other relationships we have. And then thirdly, it's the relationship between us and God, where you have divinity and humanity, that connecting relationship. All of that is all what the doctrine of the Trinity is about. And all of these relationships are based on love. All of these relationships, L-O-V-E, love. We know that the Bible tells us in John, 1 John 4, 8, that God is love, right? And we want to emphasize that not that he has love, which he does, but going further, he is love. He is a personification, as it were, of love. This is descriptive of who God is, and this is descriptive of how he lives in eternity, how he interacts with us and with other people. Before God created the universe, even before God created angelic beings, he is and was love. When God was the only being out there, only existent, the only one existing in anywhere, God was love. Because God had love between the three persons within the triunity. You see, love is relational. To have real love, it has to have a relationship. You know, love needs to be expressed toward a recipient. Therefore, God had to be more than one person in order that his love could be fully expressed in the Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit. Okay? There's more we can say on that, but just suffice it to say that that's how you can see the full expression of God's love within the Godhead. is between the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, the doctrine of the Trinity tells us that even before God created anything, he could be loved. Because, as I just mentioned, the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit loved the Father, and so forth. That circle, right? That triune circle. There was love within the triune God even before anything had been created. The three persons were distinguishable from one another, but they were united to one another in love. So, as we study the Trinity, and we understand its importance. We understand that this is why it's important. It's important for us to know the love relationship at the basis of it all. It's important to know who God is. It's important to know for who we are as well. And so, um, is, are there any questions before Any I... questions before we continue with comments? Okay. So I'm going to talk about how the doctrine of the Trinity is, is, Christ, is centered on Jesus Christ. Um, because it is through Jesus that God chooses to reveal himself to humanity. Um, that, that, that is how, because it says no one has seen God, but we have seen God only through Jesus Christ. Um, so that's why it's uh, Christ-centered, Jesus Christ-centered. And so let's now just review some of the things that we already know about Jesus or that we need to know about Jesus. So the first thing is Jesus is fully divine. Jesus is the word, as we know, made flesh. And God the Son became human. He, was, he revealed himself in a way that we could see him, in a way that we could touch him and hear him and see how he lives. See, Jesus is the way that God has chosen to reveal himself to us. You know, in John 14 and verse 8, Philip asked Jesus, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus responded in verse 9, and he says, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And um, it's important for us to note that Jesus is not here referring to physical attributes. Um, he's saying that, you know, he's referring to the most important spiritual aspects, is that his character, his purpose, his heart, and his mind. God the Father is like Jesus in the, in, in, um, and Jesus Christ in the way that he interacts with us. He's like, they're, they're like in the way they interact, not just physical attributes he's talking about. He's like um, the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They have compassion. The compassion that Jesus displayed shows what God is like, God the Father is like. The zeal for righteousness, that's what God is like. The willingness to sacrifice for others, 
God is like that too. And Jesus helps us to see what God the Father is like and the Holy Spirit as well. You know, I, I look at um, where it says his zeal for righteousness. You know, and I was just thinking about this last night as I was going over this. Um, you know, that God has a zeal for righteousness. But I think about how, how he has self-control. Because, you know, he sees so much on righteousness. You know, and you, when you think about it, you could get so mad with unrighteousness, you can just say, oh, I just obliterate everything. But he also has self-control. And we see that in Jesus. Jesus was so compassionate and kind and controlled. And so this is what Jesus came to reveal to us. So when Jesus became a flesh and blood human being, he was showing us in a tangible, in a visible way, what the triune God is like. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. And even though we cannot see God directly, Jesus shows us that. He shows us what he's like in a way that we can see and hear. In Colossians 2 verse 9 says, In Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus then is the summary of what we need to know about God. It's just a summary. As Steve says, we won't know it, it it, we won't know him in his fullness. You know, we can never know him completely. He's much bigger than our minds are capable of comprehending. And you know, I, I mentioned earlier how, you know, as we we're going up, um, you know, to Yosemite, and, you know, it was so fast, so big. I was looking up at those trees and, and the mountains, and it's, you know, he's so big compared to us. We cannot possibly understand uh, you know, um, but through Jesus, we can get a better understanding of some of the things about God. You know, Jesus embodies all that any human being can know of God. And he came to reveal that knowledge of God to us. You know, in John 1, 18, it says, no one has ever seen God. I mentioned that earlier. But the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known um, to us. So that's the one thing. Jesus is divine. The second thing is Jesus is fully human. You know, and I think all Orthodox Christians believe that. Um, they include the teaching that Jesus is fully human. He was born as a baby. He grew up as a boy and he died. As it says in John 114, it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So that means he ate ordinary food. He breathed air like an ordinary person. His fingernails grew and his toenails too. <laughs> you, know? Yes. you know, he got thirsty and tired. Yeah. When he scraped his knee, it bled. Yeah. And when he was crucified, he died just like any other person would have. So he was fully God and fully human, both at the same time. You know, and we have never, ever seen that combination before. But with God, all things are possible. You know, God can do one-of-a-kind things. He's the only one who can do the one-of-a-kind thing that don't compare to anything else. He's, a, he's able to be in his own creation. You know, the incarnation of the Son of God is the ultimate example of this. Um, and so why would Jesus, the divine person of the Trinity, want to become a human being? Well, you know, there are a number of reasons. He came to communicate to us on a level we could understand. You know, you remember the story of, um, you know, that the, the man who wanted to shoo the birds into the barn and they couldn't understand it and he thought, maybe if I became a bird. Well, this is kind of what Jesus did. He wanted to communicate on a level that we could understand. He also came to die for us. And he came to experience life as a human so that we could know for sure that he understands what it's like to be human. He wants us to know that he knows what it's like to be us, to be human. But just as Jesus shows us what God is like, he also shows us what humanity should really be like. What He is the perfect human. So he came to also show us the perfect human. Um, 
you know, because there, there's no other human. You know, when you think about it, you know, uh, Steve was mentioned that God is love. That's what he is. He's love. And you think about it, humans are kind of the opposite. You know, we have, you know, sometimes we, we love our children. But the way we act with one another is not very loving. That's why we have so many wars. And, you know, so he came to show us what the perfect human looks like. And so the other thing that Jesus does is he connects human beings to God. You know, he fulfills a very unique uh, role. He's always part of the circle of God's triune life. But now he's a part of the circle of human life. And because of that, he provides a unique connection between humanity and God. You know, in a sense, he's the bridge. He's the bridge God uses to bring humanity into divine relationship, you know, into a divine fellowship. You see, because not that we are part of the Trinity, but it is in and through Jesus' humanity that we can now share in God's divine life. You know, Second Peter, Second Peter 1, 4 says, He has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate, so we can participate in the divine nature because of Jesus. And so um, now we can participate in what God is. We are in fellowship with God, in relationship with God, and this is all made possible through Jesus. Through Jesus. And so in 1 Timothy 2.5 it says, There is one God, and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. A mediator, you see, is a person in the middle. And in this case, Jesus is the mediator. He's serving to connect humanity to God. God the Father initiated this, though. He sent Jesus to the earth to make this connection work. And Jesus is a key link, or the connector, if you will, between humanity and God. He's the pathway by which human beings are brought into the presence of the holy and perfect God. So the doctrine of the Trinity is so important for this understanding. You see, because our connection with God for our and our future with God, it is essential that our mediator be fully God in his own right and also for God's connection with humanity to be complete, it's essential that our mediator be fully human in his own right. The man Christ Jesus is what he is. So he has to be fully God and fully human in order for this connection to work. It's all centered on Christ Jesus. Any comments, questions, thoughts, uh, light bulb moments? No? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. I will never forget when uh, Dr. Stavrinides was doing a Bible study about the divinity of Christ. And we were all sitting there and he said, um, Jesus was divine because we didn't grow up believing that as youngsters in the church. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, I'm like, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Because if he was only human, mm -hmm. then he could have sinned like me. Yeah. And when I found out he was divine and actually could save us, I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> it was not a fun night in the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> he was known to uh, rattle you on certain things. Yes, you know? yes. I never took a class from him. I went to AC, but I never took a class from him. But I understood that he could, he could debate either side of an issue. He could put you on the side we believed, and he would argue opposite and then reverse it. <laughs> and uh, he, he said a lot of things that shook me up too that, uh, that helped me in my understanding so thank you I didn't know that well, about not Jesus not being divine I didn't know we taught that oh my goodness mm. I know the Holy Spirit was always an it we actually crossed out he and put it uh -huh. where it says when yeah when he the spirit comes we said nope cross it out put it uh -huh. yeah. we did that but I didn't know about it okay thank you Rose yeah I took Dr. My freshman year philosophy class and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. But the thing was he he 
um, because he always challenged you to like think of all the various ways that you could look at a particular issue. And we had grown in our mindset to this is the one way anything is looked at. So that was that paradigm shift was hard for a lot of people, but because I was that naturally is the way my brain works, and the juniors and seniors had a real hard time. They dropped out, and they really wanted to kind of cause the whole fuss because they're the last, get the last class, and you have to defend, you know, your belief. So, anyways, his, his first thing was if you can prove um, it was some basic things that we think we know. He said, you get an A in the class, you don't have to come back to class, and, he, and so. Um, but it was to prove things that we had always grown up to be just, uh, you know, we took for granted, and that upset the juniors and the seniors that they, they couldn't prove it. He said, I'll give you an A, just get up there and prove it, and wow. they couldn't do it. So, yeah. anyway, I love having a class with them. Yes. Yes, Ms. Nelson. Yes, uh, um, like a lot of Gloria had said, how we, we think we, we, uh, we think we love, you know, everybody. We really do. But, you know, I'm so glad she said that we don't. Because I could not, as uh, long as I had been in church, I never told nobody, I just couldn't like him. I don't know what it was, but, and, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because it shows that we can hate when we think we can. And it helps us do better when we see we're fixing to go that way. But I didn't dislike him, but it's like I... I didn't want to hear him about that very once or twice, because mm -hmm. I don't know what it was about it. I still don't know today. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I probably should have said it today here, but I said Well, he did make you think. I mean, your life was changed whether you left hating him or not. You know, it, it certainly made you think. And really, not all of us in this room are called to be apologetics, apologists rather. Where you defend the, to the scholars, to the skeptics, to the high, the hardcore unbelievers, you know, yeah. you got to pull out the books and research and whatever, and throw them, throw all those facts at them. Not all of us have to do that, but he seemed like he would be the most effective at doing that. But that is something that would be something we would look at if God tells us to be ready to give an answer. We don't have to be an apologist, but at least know how to defend why. We believe what we believe and why we say it. We don't have to convince them, but at least let's be sure of it ourselves. You know? And they can say, well, I don't believe it, but that's okay. That doesn't change my belief. What you said, try to challenge me. I already know that there's a God that can handle that. I mean, I have all the answers, but I know who does. And, you know, one day you're going to be seeking his help, too. Well, you know, you don't have to say that, but you know what I mean. So, thank you. Those are, you know. He's a name that will always be remembered in our circles. For <laughs> yes, any more questions? Yes. Yeah, because he, he used to just, you know, above my head. I couldn't even grasp a lot of things that he, Dr. Stavini was talking about. I, yeah. I couldn't even grasp it. Yeah, he was a challenge. Uh, we had some pastors, some ministers who were like that. I mean, I used to like to listen to Dr. Hay, but you better catch him beginning. If you come in and you miss his first statement, he talks in paragraphs, so you, you got to wait till intermission <laughs> to, to get, get caught up, right? right? But yeah, we had those. They were sharp, you know, and so they had a lot to offer, so we thank God for that. Okay, any other comments, any questions as we go to part three? And that's the, we're talking about Trinitarian theology, uh, how it relates to us. Gloria just talked about how it's all centered on Jesus Christ. Even though you've got Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, it is through Jesus Christ that we come to know God the Father and come to appreciate and receive and be led by the Holy Spirit. So, and of course, we accept Jesus' as sacrifice on our behalf. So they're all involved, but it's through Jesus Christ that we have this awareness and through whom we can have relationship to God. So let's talk about part three, which is humanity in the image of God. You know, um, Gloria was talking about uh, understanding Jesus being our mediator. And as our mediator, Jesus shows us what God is like. And he also shows us what humanity, humanity is supposed to be like. As Gloria mentioned, Jesus was the perfect human being. 
That's what Adam was supposed to have done. He was supposed to live a life as a perfect human being. But uh, the second Adam had to come in and show, okay, guys, we're out the way. Let me show you how it's done. Okay. Now, if Jesus shows us what God is like, and if he shows us what humanity is like, then because it's all centered in Jesus, there has to be some kind of similarity between God and humans in that respect, right? Now, that understanding is like God is giving it to us as a gift because it was his original intent. He created us to be perfect in him. When we look at how he created it, we can kind of understand what God was looking at. Look at, look at Genesis 1, verses 26 to 27. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female. He created them. You see? So God says at the, at the very beginning of this, our image and our likeness is how God created you and me. God did it, and he said it was good, right? He said, he'd say, oops, I made a mistake when I made man down. The joke goes that God created Adam, and he said, oh yeah, that's okay, but then he stood up like and looked back, I could do better than that, so he created Eve. That was, uh, <laughs> that's a joke there, you know, but... Uh, for some ladies, it's the gospel truth. Right? <laughs> so, but anyway, God created it was good. Male and female in his image, it was good. Because all together we are created in the image of God. To somehow resemble God. And to represent God here on earth. And again, as we mentioned earlier, it's not about skin color. Thank God. It's not about hair texture. It's not about size, it's not about weight, you know, it's not about where you are living, it's none of that stuff. The emphasis is that humanity is like God, should be like God, in a spiritual sense. And we see that emphasis in Galatians 5.22. The emphasis on how we should be like God in a spiritual sense is when we look at the fruit of the Spirit in that, in that verse. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and as we heard earlier, self-control. All these things. Humans are created to be like God in all of these ways. So now the question is, how does the doctrine of the Trinity help us to understand the conduct of humanity created in God's image? You know, does the Trinity have any bearing on how we as humans must conduct ourselves? We're creating his image, but does it just stop there? How do we live our lives as humans created in his image? Well, the bears repeating that the Trinity exists, as we mentioned earlier, in a love relationship. It was all about it before anything else was. There was a love relationship in the Trinity. So the answer would be to that question is, well, just as the persons of the Trinity interact with one another in love, so also, we ought to interact with all other humans in love, right? That's the first truth of the Holy Spirit, is love. And the way that we were made to be like God, love should be the basis for our lives. Love should be the basis for our societies and how we act, how we interact with one another. You know, um, as was mentioned earlier by Gloria and also Ms. Johnson, we, we don't tend to love as humans. We tend to be selfish early on and you know, we want to, you know, make the world centered on us. You know, we need to be trained from an early age that it's not, the world doesn't revolve around us, you know. How many of us heard that as kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tell the world does not revolve around you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we it, but we come to appreciate it when we see what that means. And of course, assuming we have kids of our own, we start yeah. to appreciate that. So anyway, um, we're created to be like that, uh, to, to have love. That should be the basis. Just as a triune God is relational with the three persons defined in reference to one another, Father, Son, and Spirit, and relationship with each other, we are also essentially relational. God did not create us to be, you know, apart. You know, the song, No Man is an Island, that's true. 
Our identity, our personhood, as it were, it depends on our relationship with other people. Again, our meaning of life is not to be found in a solitary self-existence. You know, we, you know, don't use the model of a person who goes up on a high mountain in a hut by himself, isolated from humanity. I just want to commune with nature. You know, uh, that's not the model God gives us for life, for relationships. No, the meaning of life is how we share love, living in love, and interacting in love with, with other people. We're created to be in a loving relationship with the triune God, first of all, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and mind, but also a loving relationship with others. Love your neighbor as yourself. All this reflects Jesus' relationship with the Father and the Spirit in the Trinity in which he is part. So that's how and why we were created. But then we come across the problem, sin. Sin defaces that image that God created us to be in. As you know, from the book of Genesis, early chapters, it tells us that the first humans, Adam and Eve, they didn't want life on God's terms. Because of the devil's, the serpent's influence and enticement, they decided they wanted to define their own lives apart from God's direction, apart from his instruction. Right? So, Rejecting love, joy, and peace, and so forth, instead they took selfishness. They chose selfishness to be their way of life. And you sow selfishness and you get strife and unhappiness, and that's what they experienced. You know, they were the first dysfunctional family. You know, the kids couldn't even grow up together, right? So, what does the doctrine of the Trinity reveal? about the nature of sin. We see sin occurring in the first book of the Bible and its damaging effects. But what does the Bible have to say about sin? And what does it talk about knowing what sin is? Well, if good is defined as humanity being in the image of God, God said that being created in His image is good, then sin is doing those things that are unlike God. Moving away from the model, the image that he wants us to be. If God is a relational being, and we were created to be in a relationship of love, then what we find when we have sin, is we find that sin is a disruption of our loving relationship. That disruption causes problems in all the relationships that we discussed, you know, as far as humans are concerned. It does not describe, there's, there's no sin in the Godhead, but there is sin that there's problems and disruptions because of sin in our relationship with one another and uh, our relationship with God. <coughs> our relationship with God falls short because of sin. That happened with Adam and Eve and that continues to us today living in this fallen world of which the devil is the God of. Right? So we see that as a problem. Now, practically speaking, as a practical matter, we have rules that describe what a good relationship is, whether they're unspoken or spoken. There are some rules that define what a good relationship is. In a good relationship, you know, we don't lie to each other. You know, maybe a little white lie to, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know guy says, uh, honey, do you love my balls yet? Oh, yes, honey. <laughs> Of course, we, we get the question, am I fat? You know, oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh. There's no right answer to that. Yeah, yeah, just make me look fat, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. nobody, even if I, say, if I say yes, of course, I'm in the doghouse for a year. If I say no, I didn't just say no. Oh, right. No right answer. No right answer. But in general, we don't give the lies that really harm and damage a relationship. We don't lie about, you know, us creeping on the side, right? right. We don't steal from one another. We don't dishonor or dis dis disrespect one another in general, right? Now, just because you have a relationship that doesn't have all these as a problem, as a disruption, doesn't guarantee that you're going to have the perfect relationship, that there's is perfect but I'm telling you, if you broke any of those, it would harm the relationship greatly, you know. And we see from this that rules, 
especially when it comes to relationships, it's not a rule for its own sake, you know, just because you can't, let's make a rule saying you can do this, you can do that. No, it serves a greater purpose, and that's to maintain the relationship in a love way. Base the love, base the relationship on love, okay? And so that's what we see when sin came in the way. When humanity rejected God, we rejected Him as the source of love that we need. Like the song says, we started looking for love in all the wrong places. We didn't look to it from God. We were created to be in a loving God in a relationship with Him, but we went in our own total direction. And it's been chaotic, it's been sick, you know, we have generation after generation growing up trying to find happiness and love and contentment through drinking, through illicit sex, through partying, through just trying to escape, you know. And the thing is, is that relationships, especially among celebrities, I think celebrities are one of the worst models for relationships. Oh, my goodness. You know, you know, they're in and out of relationships with one another. And, uh, you know, they're supposed to be the people that kids and others look up to. Oh, yeah. But they're not the example of that. You know, first of all, many of them are egotistical and are selfish and living like that. And even among the best of them, you know, they don't show the ideal because of the pressure of being in that type of job. But it's not just celebrities. It's, it's people in the, it could be sports figures. It could be politicians, you know. We're all going the wrong way, especially if we have opportunity to show love to others and influence others. If you don't have the love of God, you're going to go astray. And that's what we see. We see defacing, defacing the image that God created us to be in, in relationship with Him, and with relationship with one another, and relationship with Him and us. Well, Jesus came to help take care of that. We were created in the image of God. But more specifically, we find that the Bible tells us that with Jesus, we are created in His image, right? You see, after Genesis, you know, the Bible doesn't say a whole much more about the image of God. You know, we see it in Genesis 1, and there might be a few scattered scriptures, but it doesn't really emphasize that point. But we see the New Testament pick it up. The New Testament has many scriptures that talk about the image of God, specifically as it applies to Jesus, okay? Now, we've already seen Colossians 1.15 where it says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And again, He is the image that Adam failed to be. He shows us in a visible way what God is like in the invisible spiritual world and how we are to represent that on earth. Uh, Hebrews 1.3 tells us something similar. It says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. So when we see Jesus, we see what the Father is like in relation to Jesus. So we expect God to be like Jesus in His compassion and in His mercy and His love, all three of which we saw in the person of Jesus on earth. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We who with unfa unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So... What we're saying is, is that being in Christ, we begin to look more and more like Him, the way He is spiritually, in relation to the Father and the Spirit, as it will be from eternity to eternity. And another scripture, Colossians 3.10 says that we have all put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its Creator, Jesus Christ. Now, since Christ is the image, since Jesus is the image of God, when we become more like Christ Jesus, we are becoming, we are being brought back more into the image that God had intended us that we're supposed to be in. Right now, it's primarily a spiritual transformation, which is fine, because that's how it starts, mentally, ethically, and relationally. But eventually, it will be a physical transformation as well. This is all based on God's original plan. He's working on us from the inside out, so that we can be changed to be like Him inside, but then externally He's going to change us so that we will have a spiritual transformation. We'll be just like Jesus because Jesus has a glorified human body in addition to His divinity that He had from before the world. We're going to be like Jesus and we're all going to have that as well. Okay? That's all part of God's plan. 
Now, another way to look at this, Paul has, uh, in talking about the image, uh, when we're talking about Adam and Eve, um, he's talking about our relationship with God. He says, he compares Adam with Jesus Christ, Romans 5. Verse 14, Romans 5, 14 says that Adam was a type. Adam was a model, a pattern of the one to come. But he goes on to say that you know, Adam messed up. Just as the first Adam brought in sin and death, the second Adam brought in righteousness and life. Just as we shared in the results of the first Adam, boy, are we, are we not experiencing that, the craziness of this fallen world, evil world. So also we share the benefits of the second Adam, okay, which is, who is Jesus. And in Christ we're already sitting in heaven places with him because he's already giving us the peace and the love that only heaven can provide us in this crazy world. So let's see what Paul has to say when he summarizes this in verses 18 and 19 of Romans 5. Just as one trespass, which is Adam's sin, resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act, and that was of Jesus, resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, uh, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Okay? So again, Adam messed it up, but Jesus did it right. And in Christ, all humanity has a fresh start on being in the image of God. Jesus is the key to our transformation, not only by example, but also by the process. He works in us, giving us the power and the direction to accomplish that transformation. Comments, questions? We're going to go to... Yes, Regina. So, with Jesus, is he the focal point by which we see the attributes of the Father and the Holy Spirit also including himself? Yes. Oh, okay. The scripture says that Jesus, uh, we, through, through Jesus, we see the deity in bodily form, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Through I'm him. sorry. Yes, through Jesus. Okay. Yeah, that scripture. I don't have the exact um, chapter verse, but I promise you it's in the Bible. Okay. Okay. Well, that was it. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. And so in part four, we're going to move on to covenant relationship. Um, because we talked about uh, the Trinitarian theology has to do with relationship. And so let's look at covenant relationship and, and the formula, you know, because, you know, even though Steve was talking about the image of God, we were made in the image of God, and the Old Testament does not use that phrase, image of God, very often. We saw it in Genesis, and I don't know where else it mentions it, but it does talk about relationships we have with God in terms uh, the term that's used uh, for the most of the time is covenant. And we can see the basic idea in Exodus 8-7, which, where um, God said, uh, Exodus 6-7, yeah, yeah. Um, where um, God says, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. You know, so that, that was a, a relationship and they said that they, they, they will be his people. Um, in the law, and the prophets, God repeatedly talks about covenant between God and humanity. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Isaac, Jacob, Aaron, and David. And in each covenant, he says, in effect, I have made with you a covenant relationship. And as you live according to it, then our relationship will be good. It will be a good one. And so the goal of the covenant was for God and humanity, or God and his people at the time, the chosen people, were to have an ongoing relationship. But there was also a new covenant promised. You know, the people of Israel, as we know, they broke covenant. They broke covenant time and time again. They broke covenant. Eventually, through the prophets, God promised that there would be a new covenant um, made in the hearts of people. And God's spirit would be in them. And so this covenant was not something that pe that we could achieve, that people could achieve for themselves. Because as we saw, Israel broke every covenant. So it would be something that God would do. God would have to do for them. 
you know, he would give them a new heart and a new spirit. Um, in Jeremiah 31 and verse 33, it says, This is a covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declared the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will, and they will be my people. So the covenant relationship between God and humanity will be focused and embodied in one person we now know to be Jesus. And the covenant that we have with God is found in Him. You know, He is the covenant for all the people. So our connection to God depends 100% on Jesus. And so... Um, so we're going to look now at the relationship terms in the New Testament. The New Testament said that we have this new covenant in Christ, but this is not the only relationship terms, term that's used in the New Testament. Um, for example, it calls us children of God. We're adopted into the family. I think Steve was speaking the other day, and he said that one analogy is not enough to describe the relationship that we have. Um, with God. So we're children of God. We're adopted into the family of God. Um, Romans 8.15 says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. So we're adopted. And this means we become part of God's family with rights and privileges that are part of being into the royal family. So we are now in a new social class. We're now royalty. And now Paul uses another relationship term in 2 Corinthians 11 2. He says, I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. So now we, we're describing another um, way to describe the relationship. We're, we're children. We're in the family, into a royal family now. But now we are the bride that will be presented to a husband. So here, um, the covenant formula is used again with the bride, because the bride has to say yes, right? Um, so um, this time is in the context of a wedding. God will live with us, and we will live with him. We will be his children, adopted as siblings of Jesus Christ, part of the royal family forever. And through Jesus, we are brought into fellowship with a triune God, sharing in his status as sons or sons and daughters. And we share the same status as his, his son. Okay, so we have covered uh, the first half of, of part one of our study of the Trinity, in particular the, looking at what is Trinitarian theology. Um, it's... We looked at why we needed it. We looked at how it's centered on Jesus Christ. We looked at how we as humans are created in the image of Christ. And then also now, we looked at um, the covenant relationship. You know, how that the relationship uh, between us. It was a covenant in the Old Testament, and we have a new covenant here, but the new covenant is multifaceted. So that's the, you know, we're, we're pretty much out of time for today to, to go with this any further. But next time, when we, we're going to recap what we covered today. We're going to talk about Trinity and salvation. Where does salvation fit in with the Trinity? What's the role of the Trinity in our salvation? We're going to talk about, uh, in a practical sense, probably one of the, uh, what's our takeaway from this? How do we respond? All this that we're studying about God, the Trinity, understanding what it's about, what the Godhead is, how he relates to us. How do we respond to that? What should be our, our, our way of life? And then we're going to give an overall conclusion. So that's the next time we have this, which is what probably next month, uh, in the end of, end of June, end of next month. So stay tuned till then, and we will uh, continue this. Any final questions? Any final comments? Uh, yes. doesn't. Oh, yeah.
Yes. Um, I remember his, you know, he, he was trained by his mom. You know, he was actually given to his mom to raise him. But he didn't know, right? Well, probably as a little kid. And then he had to come back to um, live in the Pharaoh's home, you know, as a, as a son. He was being trained as a prince under Pharaoh. But I think at that time he became aware. But he had to, you know. And, and somebody did something to him. He blew his wife and killed the Egyptian. And it was as if he knew he had Yes, yes, so he did. Yeah, he did. Yes. No, I was getting ready to refer to what she just said. Go ahead. Said. Go ahead. The, uh, uh, that he uh, uh, tried to get the two to Israel fight. not to about the fighting because they were one, you know. And he, I think he did know that he yes. from from that yeah. episode. That's right. Yeah, he killed the Egyptian, and then another time he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he tried yes. to split them up. He says, "Oh, you're going to try to referee this." Fight and you already killed an Egyptian the other day? Oh, they go like this. Had the Egyptian done something to a Hebrew, right? The reason why he did it. Yeah, I think, you know, I think these were uh, slave drivers. Right. He's probably just got fed up with how his, his man was being treated by the slave driver. Yeah, and the people didn't understand why he would take that side. That's why I remembered it. Why he would take the side of the Right, right. Well, he, he's a double agent. He was a super <laughs> agent. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Are we going to close? Yes, Regina. One last thing. Now, this is all in the statements of the belief, correct? Well, some of it. Some of it is. You know, the doctrine of the Trinity, uh -huh. the basic doctrine of the Trinity, is in the statement of beliefs. But Trinitarian theology is a whole another study. Okay. And so that's what we're delving into today. But because it's based on the Trinity, we spent a lot of time describing the Godhead, the triumph Godhead. I only ask that because it, it, I would like to be told ahead of time so I could bring that statement in with me and make little notes. We can yeah. keep a copy up there on the bulletin board if it's okay. Where's Rose? She had to go out there to fix the food. Why don't you ask her to put a copy of the statement of beliefs up there? And if she okay. needs a copy from me, I'll, I'll get it to her. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That way, you can always refer to it. You don't have to haul it around. Okay. Oh, is that? I'm sorry. Did I misunderstand what you wanted? Did you want to make your own notes on it? Yeah, I wanted. Yeah. Want, yeah, and I wanted to make notes on it. So okay. Just when you, you know, a little. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, sure. But still, that would be nice for her to put it up there. Let's do that. Let's have that up there. Uh huh. There's some. There's still some. Old, new, and borrowed, and blue up there, so we need, to, we need to fix that. Any other questions? Any other um, comments? Just huh? quick comments, yeah. Steve. You know, I, I, I've been sitting here trying to remember how did we, how did WCG teach me about to understand Jesus? And Seller was right. He wasn't. We didn't consider him the divine. Um, he wasn't the wasn't the, the average human. He was kind of, I don't know, he was a little bit more than an angel, but it's like a spirit that had manifested itself in flesh. He was, but it certainly wasn't, wow. he wasn't a divine being. I know. But I know yes. For me, it's, it's been a long time. I remember Mr. Armstrong talking about the duality of the Godhead, Father, Son. And if it was, as he defined, a duality that elevated Christ, but I can't remember the duality, the two trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Got, uh, and the yeah. spirit was a force. It <laughs> wasn't. Oh, the yeah. spirit. That was something for sure. The whole sure. spirit was, oh, yeah, it was right. not, a force. Right. It was a force. Right. 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 Well, thank God our understanding is being more clear. Amen to that. I think it begins with us understanding the centrality of Jesus. Remember when we used to teach that the gospel was not about Christ? Yes. We used to teach that. You know, we just had it wrong in so many different ways. But thank God. I'm glad we stuck around to see a change. You know? I was ready to bail, but God kept me going. You know. I really don't have a reference point for him, except that when I was home in Chicago, my brother used to get the magazine Plain Truth. Right. Okay, but I never, because when I came here, and I did join this. All of that was gone. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. 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 Yeah. All yeah. that was, had been changed and yeah. what have you.
But you would run across some members. Yeah, um, Nufani was trying to bring me up. Oh, yeah. And then also Marion was telling me some of the history. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, I got the tap on the shoulder that we should, we should close. <laughs> so, yeah, Mike's keeping me honest here. So we'll, we'll continue this when we have our part two. And uh, thank you very much for your participation. And let's give God the glory that he deserves, Father, Son, and Spirit.